Hello, and welcome to today's training, How to Help Clients Overcome Social Anxiety, Part 2, Using Exposures as Experiments to Build Self-Confidence. We are happy to have with us again, Larry I. Cohen, L-I-C-S-W. I am Mary Geist, Director of Programs here at ADAA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of an attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this um, in the looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would like to now introduce you to Larry Cohen, LICSW. He's co-founder and chair of the National Social Anxiety Center with nine regional clinics around the country. Mr. Cohen is also the director of the Social Anxiety Help Clinic in Washington, D.C. since 1990, where he has provided CBT for more than 1,000 persons with social anxiety and has conducted 85 20-week social anxiety CBT groups. He is certified as a diplomat in cognitive therapy by the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. He's also um, a chair of the ADAA Social Anxiety Special Interest Group, which will actually relaunch its monthly online peer consultation sessions on March 28th. So please contact me if you're interested in participating. Now I know you're anxious to get over to the content, so I'm going to pass the screen over to Mr. Cohen and there will be a brief pause while I do so. Thank you everybody and welcome. Hello. Welcome to the second webinar on social anxiety. I want to start by describing how the first and second webinars are a little different. The first webinar, which I imagine most of you attended, and if you haven't, I encourage you to listen to online on the ADAA website, was an overview of the five major cognitive behavioral therapy PBT strategies for social anxiety using experiments, sometimes called exposures, cognitive restructuring, mindful focus, assertion training, and core belief work. Today's webinar will be much more in depth and primarily focus on using experiments as a way to decrease social anxiety and also to build self-confidence. I will touch on the other four techniques, the other four strategies that I just mentioned, because they, are, they all come together in the context of doing experiments, but I will not go into them in depth. So if you want to learn more about those, please listen to the first part webinar. Also, you have a long set of handouts, which was the same handouts for the first webinar. In this webinar, I'm only going to refer to a handful of the pages. The rest of them are all referred to in the first webinar. So again, I encourage you to listen to that. I want to highlight the first page of the long set of handouts over here. This is a resource page. It describes, first of all, the National Social Anxiety Center, which I'm part of. And if any of you want to be part of, please contact me. And there's two levels of membership that we can describe. And then there's also various resources that are quite useful for both therapists and consumers. So I encourage you to really look at that. The first thing I want to say is that the main purpose, from my point of view, from a CBT point of view, of doing experiments is for learning. That's why I prefer to use the CBT term experiments rather than the more behavioral therapy term exposure, although clearly the experiments are exposures. But exposure, that word, comes from the model where the goal is habituation, a lessening of anxiety by staying in an anxiety-triggering situation long enough. 
Lessening anxiety is certainly one of the goals. Clients are probably coming to you for that purpose after all, but it's not the only goal. The other goal with social anxiety is increasing self-confidence. And this is described best by looking at the anxiety formula, which is one uh, a handout that I gave out over here. It's on its own page. And this is a formulation of what causes an increase in the intensity of anxiety, whether it's social anxiety or anything else. And basically it says the intensity of anxiety is determined by how likely we perceive a threat to be, how severe we, do, we perceive the threat to be. Is it a, something that we think would cause us only a little harm or very severe harm or something in between? Those two things are multiplied by each other. So even if one is relatively low, as long as it's not zero, if the other is high, it will still be strong anxiety intensity. Added to that is basic physiology. We don't give a lot of attention to that, but it's acknowledging that maybe drinking a lot of coffee or the side effects of certain medications, or for all we know, our genetic heritage can also contribute to our anxiety, of course. Now all of this is the numerator. It is divided by how well we think we can cope with the anxiety threat. So even if we think the threat is quite likely and quite severe, but we believe that we can cope well with it, the anxiety formula shows that our intensity of anxiety will be relatively low. Of course, the reverse is true as well. Even if we think that the threat severity is only moderate or relatively mild, if we think our ability to cope with it is quite small, then we will still feel relatively strong anxiety, given whatever our physiology may be. The reason for this anxiety formula, which is, you know, a conceptualization, it may not be precisely accurate, but it's at least roughly accurate, is that it helps us learn that part of what we're aiming toward in anxiety is in, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy for social anxiety, is helping clients learn that they can cope with anxiety and that what they perceive to be a severe threat is in most instances a relatively small threat that they can cope with well, and sometimes that that threat isn't very likely. Now that's important because the main threat that people with social anxiety are concerned about, of course, is the fear of judgment, which could come as embarrassment, which basically means the belief that we are appearing foolish in the eyes of others, or the fear of direct criticism, or rejection, or silent judgment, that people will think badly of us. It's not very helpful to try to teach clients that the likelihood of that threat is relatively minor, because even if they believe that, which they may already, if they believe that it would be horrible, in other words, the severity would be very high, and I can't cope with it, then even if the likelihood is, is very low, as long as it's above zero, they would still feel quite anxious. So what we're really aiming toward is helping clients learn self-confidence, which basically I define as the belief that you can cope with difficult things, and as a result, they won't be so severe, if at all. So the goal of social anxiety treatment is not simply calmness, which is the reduction of the intensity of anxiety, or the other term for that, of course, would be habituation. The goal is not just habituation or becoming calm. The goal is also increasing our self-confidence, our belief that we can cope with whatever challenges are out there. Because the fears of social anxiety are not irrational fears. Judgments happen. They probably happen more or less every day. They tend to be more positive than socially anxious people think, but they are sometimes negative. So the goal of treatment is calmness, but also self-confidence.
Because of that, that probably at least partly explains, if not largely explains, why outcome studies show that purely exposure therapy aimed at habituation, although is moderately effective for social anxiety treatment, is less effective than cognitive behavioral therapy, which incorporates both exposure therapy plus changing, helping people learn to change the way they think about things. Because CBT would be aimed at increasing their sense of being able to cope with things, as well as a sense that maybe we've overblown how severe the threat actually is, and maybe also how likely it is. Whereas exposure therapy alone, without any cognitive piece to it, is really aimed just at decreasing the intensity of anxiety. This can also help explain why re research shows that with social anxiety treatment anyways, unlike other anxiety disorders, cognitive behavioral therapy is not only more effective than exposure therapy alone, but cognitive behavioral therapy is more effective than medication therapy alone. And this is actually unusual because for most other disorders, CBT and medications are more or less equal in effectiveness, at least in the short run, although CBT tends to have much better outcomes in the long run. But with social anxiety treatment, CBT is more effective than medications even in the shorter run. Interestingly, there's some recent research that shows that CBT alone tends to be more effective, at least for most people, certainly not for everyone, than a combination of medication and CBT. And so that may help explain this as well, that when we are relying on medication, we tend to put our self-confidence in the medication, not in ourselves. So it's not self-confidence, it's confidence in a pill or confidence in the medication, as opposed to confidence in ourselves. In any event, CBT is the most effective treatment. So again, the focus of exposures in CBT for social anxiety is learning to overcome the sense that we cannot cope and that the severity of the threat is very large. It's learning to build self-confidence. As a result, the cognitive work is more or less equally important to the exposure work. Now I want to talk about how one chooses experiments. So let me go to the other handouts. Because of the focus being on, let's see, where is it? Because of the focus of exposures, which I prefer to call experiments because that word implies it's a learning experience, because of the focus being on learning, um, it's important that we choose experiments based on what it would be most helpful for clients to learn. Basically, again, that the threat that they're imagining is not as severe as they think. Um, and often, in fact, very positive things can happen rather than the severely negative things they anticipate. And also, to the extent that a negative thing occurs, we're hoping to have them learn that they can cope with that well, so it is not more than just an awkward blip. Based on that, it's important to choose experiments according to a client's goals, according to a client's hot thoughts, automatic thoughts that are upsetting to them, and according to a client's underlying core beliefs and underlying assumptions. Notice what I'm not saying is that it's important to choose experiments according to a fear and avoidance hierarchy. In the habituation model of overcoming anxiety disorders, including social anxiety, fear and avoidance hierarchies are a very central piece. And we would do graduated, more or less step-by-step -step exposure, starting more or less midway on their hierarchy, and gradually, at whatever rate the client is willing to go, expose them to one anxiety trigger at a time until habituation occurs. With the learning model of overcoming social anxiety, fear and avoidance hierarchies 
are a useful tool but not a central tool and the main usefulness of a fear hierarchy is to decrease avoidance. If we suggest to a client to do an experiment, an exposure, because we think it would be a great learning experience, but the client thinks it would be terrifying and they don't do it, then it won't be a learning experience at all. Worse yet, it might be a negative learning experience because it reinforced the avoidance pattern and the underlying belief that they can't handle this, they can't cope with it which is the exact opposite learning we're hoping for. So the basic use of a fear and avoidance hierarchy, and let me show you an example of one for social anxiety. Um, here it is. Here's a sample one on page 13 and 14, and a blank one on page 11. The basic use of a fear and avoidance hierarchy is really to help clients see that if something feels too scary to do, there's always some less scary version to do it. Some people find it is useful to have a client complete a fear and avoidance hierarchy early in therapy and maybe occasionally revise it as we go. Um, certainly that's what I've been doing originally. But over time, I find that it's more helpful to approach a fear hierarchy in an informal way. So when a client and I come up with an experiment idea, and they feel that it's too scary, too frightening for them to handle now, I ask them informally, what do you think a less scary version would be? Maybe if we lowered the goals. Maybe if we changed the setting a little bit. So all of that is discussing how can we move it further down your fear hierarchy so you feel ready to experiment with that, that situation, ready to do that exposure. So the fear hierarchy is not the main way we choose experiments anymore. The main ways, as I said, are according to a client's goals and values as well as to test out a client's hot thoughts and underlying beliefs and assumptions. So let me give you some examples. If a client is seeking to work on making friends or being more comfortable socializing, obviously we would want to help the client choose experiments, more or less hierarchically according to what they feel they can tolerate, to choose experiments in the realm of things that would work toward making friends. It might be joining a meetup. Meetup.com is an enormously useful resource as our Yahoo groups and Google groups to help clients find groups to attend in real life, not just online, um, where they can work on mingling with new people, getting to know new people, inviting new people out, befriending new people, and so forth. And the settings are usually very good because they're called meetups after all because most people are going there to meet other people and not simply to do an activity. So that's an example of choosing experiments according to goals, but a client may have very different goals. They may be working on career advancement and their social anxiety is getting in the way of that. It could be getting in the way of doing job interviews or networking activities, which are like social activities except focus around career and job issues. There's all sorts of ways clients can turn those activities into experiments as well. Practicing job interviews, doing job interviews, going to networking groups and mingling there and so forth. It could be public speaking related goals in which a client might work using Toastmasters, which is a wonderful, very old organization that has all sorts of public speaking support groups around the country. It's on the resource page. It's toastmasters.org. Um, and it's a great place to do experiments for clients that want to work on that. Plus, they may have staff meetings and other things in their work setting or organizational activities they may participate in as a volunteer or a church where they could also practice speaking in front of groups as well. Some clients have very different goals. They may have social anxiety in sexual situations. Sexual performance anxiety, although it has its own diagnosis in the DSM, is actually a form of social anxiety because it's based on the fear of 
judgment, a scrutiny of embarrassment. And so their homework may be involved in a series of sexual ex exposure experiments. Um, and also periresis, in other words, severe pee shyness, bladder shyness, which is also a form of social anxiety in most cases. It can be caused for purely physical reasons, but it is more typically caused uh, by self-consciousness and the anxiety that goes with that about others being around or possibly coming into the bathroom. Um, those type of goals lead to very different experiments involving doing exposures in different bathrooms, more or less hierarchically, depending on how hard a client finds those experiences. Now, as I said, we also choose experiments according to the learning we're hoping to have clients experience to challenge their hot thoughts, their underlying assumptions, and their core beliefs, all three levels. Uh, there's all sorts of examples I can give, but just let me give you a few. Common hot thoughts for social anxiety might be, I won't know what to say in a conversation. I might say something stupid and usually implied in that and that it would just destroy my reputation or lead the person to think poorly of me at that time or be horribly embarrassing. Uh, or the person will find me uninteresting. Well, we could do all sorts of experiments in which we're testing out those thoughts where the client is learning how to focus mindfully. I'll explain more about that later in a conversation and to say whatever comes to mind naturally rather than trying to script what to say and then assess afterwards how the conversation goes as a result. Interestingly, part of what they learn is sometimes they do say something stupid or that they perceive as stupid, but if they continue the conversation, they'll learn that generally that has no impact on the conversation beyond an awkward sentence or awkward second or two. So that's important learning as well, that the severity of the threat, in this case saying something so-called stupid, is actually relatively minor, even if it does occur. Finally, we can choose experiments according to underlying assumptions and core beliefs. And so I want to show a handout toward the end of this uh, long list, um, page 37 and 8, which describes different ways of choosing experiments specifically to challenge core beliefs. In this handout, I don't distinguish core beliefs and underlying assumptions. I realize that they're different, but they are so related, I don't find it enormously helpful to stress the distinction. I do experiments for both. So there are straightforward experiments where we are testing out our underlying assumptions uh, with direct goals, such as I'm going to talk to strangers I'm attracted to, I'm going to talk to uh, uh, joint group conversations with strangers, I'm going to speak at staff meetings as a way to test out underlying core beliefs such as I'm socially inept or I'm uninteresting to people uh, or I make a bad impression. Those are examples of core beliefs that could be tested by straightforward experiments. We can also do conceptualize this as rebel experiments, uh, by which I mean choosing to rebel against what your old core beliefs are telling you to do. So if your old core beliefs are saying, don't talk to people you're attracted to, or don't talk to new people unless you have a friend by your side, or speak very briefly when you talk to new people or when you speak in groups, so that you limit the opportunity to make a bad impression. One way to approach experiments to challenge those core beliefs is to say, well, I'm going to try rebelling against the core beliefs, doing more or less the opposite of what they tell me to do as a way to test out how valid they are or not. So if the old core beliefs tell me not to talk to strangers or at least to people I'm attracted to, I'm going to go out of my way in this social setting and talk to the people I'm most attracted to. Or if the old core beliefs tell me to keep 
my focus on the other person in conversation by asking lots of questions and saying little about myself. I'm going to make sure that I talk more about myself in the conversation. I, ideally not entirely about oneself, but at least more about oneself than we're used to as a way to rebel against the old core belief and test out how valid they are and so forth. Paradoxical experiments which can be done at the level of core beliefs and then I also have a handout that I want to show you. Let me see if I can find it. I'm doing paradoxical experiments that goes into more detail whether we're doing them at the core belief level or at another level. Um, let me find that. Here we go. Um, a paradoxical experiment which some clinicians call shame attacking experiments, other clinicians call social mishap experiments. I call them paradoxical because the goal is paradoxical. So in a straightforward experiment you have a straightforward goal such as talking to new people, sharing your contact information, speaking in groups, asserting yourself. Those are examples of straightforward goals. Straightforward because they are working toward a client's larger therapy goals. Paradoxical experiments choose goals that are the opposite of what they normally would want to be doing. In fact, we are making the feared outcome the goal paradoxically. So for example, a paradoxical experiment might have it as a goal to do things to embarrass yourself on purpose, to ask stupid questions on purpose, to make mistakes on purpose, to seek out rejection rather than to seek out a date, to uh, make a bad impression on purpose, to seek criticism on purpose, to show anxiety on purpose. Many people with social anxiety, of course, have anxiety about their anxiety showing and paradoxically they might do experiments in which they're going out of their way to show anxiety. They may make themselves red and if their anxiety is about blushing or make themselves blood, uh, sweat if their anxiety is about that or they may simply acknowledge to someone, by the way I'm feeling kind of nervous now, I often do. Those are all examples of paradoxical experiments where we can test both our hot thoughts Someone won't like me if they see my anxiety, for example, as well as our underlying core beliefs, which might be I have to make a perfect impression for someone to like me. Um, paradoxical experiments are usually experiments that new clients are unwilling to do, although that's not always the case, but usually by the middle point of therapy, uh, once they've already had some success with straightforward experiments, um, clients become more and more willing to do paradoxical ones which paradoxically are often quite fun after the initial fear goes down. Um, there's often uh, a transformation of anxiety into humor, realizing it's kind of funny to say stupid things on purpose and realize nothing terrible happens other than an awkward moment. Um, so those are examples of choosing experiments based on hot thoughts and underlying assumptions as well as core beliefs, both straightforward and paradoxical experiments. One of the most important things in doing experiments, in helping a client prepare to do experiments, is helping them to identify safety behaviors, I prefer to call them safety seeking behaviors, that they rely on and helping them decide which of those they feel able to drop at this point. This is true really for any exposure work. I think it's especially important for social anxiety exposure. And so I want to discuss it a little bit in depth. Safety seeking behaviors come in two categories. Avoidance, which of course are those things we do too little of, and compensation, which I commonly call crutches with clients, which are things we rely on too much. Either of them are safety-seeking behaviors. 
In the case of avoidance, obviously the biggest example, which is quite common but not universal with social anxiety, is simply not going to the activity, not going to the meeting, not speaking up at the meeting, not speaking to new people at the activity, not asserting yourself when in fact you have something to say, not going to a scary public bathroom and only going to private ones. Those are all examples of avoidance. However, there are all sorts of examples of more covert forms of avoidance when a client does actually go to the activity. It could be speaking very briefly, the so-called it's like pulling teeth form of conversing where the socially anxious person answers a question in one or two words and keeps returning the focus back on the other person. So that's a more kind of covert form of avoidance or speaking very briefly at meetings, speaking very quickly at meetings to get the attention off of themselves, um, not asserting themselves and saying things like whatever you'd like to do would be fine with me or I don't have an opinion when they really do. Those are examples of more covert forms of avoidance. And finally, other kinds of crutches that a client might use as a safety-seeking behavior might include staying by a friend's side when they are at a party much and feeling very anxious when the friend goes to a bathroom or goes speak to someone else on their own. It might include a lot of scripting, which is really important, planning ahead of time what they're going to say. They might be scripting this before they go to the activity or before they go to the meeting. Or they might be scripting in their mind while they're engaged in the conversation. What do I say next? What's the next thing I ask this person? What's the next thing I say? Which, of course, distracts them from truly listening and having things to say that come to mind naturally. So scripting is another safety-seeking behavior. And finally, on a purely internal level, but it is behavioral, it is a volitional action, a behavior, is self-monitoring. And this is really important. Many clients, actually most clients, with social anxiety to at least some degree and sometimes to a very, very debilitating degree, do a lot of self-monitoring and self-evaluation while they are engaging in some activity that they are socially anxious about. And they could be self-monitoring various facets of their experience. It might be monitoring their anxiety itself because they're afraid that the anxiety symptoms will show, sweating, blushing, jittery, hesitant voice, etc. Or they may be self-monitoring, self-critiquing, in other words, their performance, having a so-called running commentary going on in their mind of how well they are doing. I like to use an analogy with clients that most people understand as a way to convey to clients how self-monitoring actually hurts them rather than benefits them. And I give the example of an actor on stage, because stage fright, after all, is a form of social anxiety. And imagining that the actor is very anxious about how will the audience perceive her performance, how will the professional critics who may be in the audience write up her performance, all of that Anxiety is quite natural and her career to some degree may depend on people's evaluation, so it's natural she's going to experience stage fright or social anxiety. But I explain to clients, imagine what would happen if that actor, while she's performing her role on stage, is self-monitoring. How well am I coming across? How well is the audience responding to me? How come there's rustling in the seats? How come the people in the initial rows are looking away rather than looking at me? How come people aren't laughing where they're supposed to or are laughing when they're not supposed to or I didn't handle this line as well as I should have or I'm not moving in the way I had planned? Even though all those concerns have a certain logic to them, I ask the client, what do you imagine would happen if the actor is thinking about all those things while she's performing the role, and almost anybody can see that, well, that will hurt her performance. And that's the main message, that self-monitoring, although it's aimed at improving how well we come across, 
actually backfires and hurts how well we're coming across because it distracts us from paying full attention, from being mindfully focused, and it makes it hard, if not literally impossible, for our brain to just free associate and have things to say naturally. And so that's an example of how self-monitoring hurts that I explain to clients. The other thing that it's important to help clients learn is how safety-seeking behaviors hurt us in general, not just the example of self-monitoring. I stress to them that the fact that you rely on avoidance or various crutches is perfectly logical. It makes sense because in the short run, it usually, not always, but usually results in lessened anxiety. And so you're getting rewarded. If you don't go to a party or don't speak up at a staff meeting that you're anxious about or don't assert yourself with somebody that you have some, something to say to but you're anxious about doing so, that those avoidance activities, those avoidance actions will lessen your anxiety in all likelihood in the short run. Similarly, if you rely on various safety-seeking behaviors, at least sometimes they also lessen your anxiety. So there's a logic to why you're engaging in these safety-seeking behaviors, but it's a short-sighted logic. And it's something you probably learned in childhood or adolescence, and I explained that children, after all, are by nature short-sighted. They're not thinking long-term, how is this going to affect me? And so it makes sense that Patterns that you learned in childhood are things that you rely on in adult because they help you, or at least used to help you in the short run. But then I ask clients, what are the ways that these, that this avoidance and other safety-seeking behaviors have hurt you in the long run? And almost every client is able to give all sorts of examples of how it has hurt them. And so I explain that Relying on safety-seeking behaviors helps in the short run, perhaps, but hurts in the long run, and partly it hurts because you are reinforcing the hot thoughts and the underlying core beliefs and assumptions that led to the behaviors in the first place that created the anxiety. So although safety-seeking behaviors may decrease your anxiety in the short run, they actually increase your anxiety in the long run. And then I also explained the other aspect of it, which is learning. That to the extent that you are relying on safety-seeking behaviors to decrease your anxiety, even if they're successful in decreasing your anxiety, mainly what you're learning is, I need to rely on that safety-seeking behavior in the future. So if somebody with the fear of speaking in groups relies on the safety-seeking behavior of spending hours and hours and hours and days and months preparing for something, then not only are they wasting time, but even if they do a good job, they're not building self-confidence. They're building confidence in their safety behavior, and so the next time they're going to feel like they have to spend at least that much time in preparation as well. And so they're not building a sense of self-confidence, which is one of the key aims in overcoming social anxiety. Now, I need to mention a proviso. It is not realistic often, in fact probably usually, to expect the client to drop all their safety-seeking behaviors at once. Doing so will be too scary for them often. If it isn't, then fine, go for it. But often it will feel way too scary for them and they simply won't do the experiment. Most of our socially anxious clients are quite expert in the art of avoidance. And so we don't want to give them more reasons to avoid. So there's a discussion that needs to happen in preparing for an experiment as to which safety-seeking behaviors you feel ready to drop and which ones you might want to hold on to temporarily and work on later. And that's fine. You'll still learn. In fact, you'll learn more by doing the experiment and relying only on a couple safety-seeking behaviors rather than the whole array of them than they would learn by choosing not to do any safety-seeking behaviors, but then avoiding the experiment altogether, of course. So it's not black and white. There's a little bit of negotiating discussion going on as to what your goals are, what the safety-seeking behaviors are that you're willing to drop at this point, or which ones you don't feel ready to drop. 
The next thing I want to talk about is cognitive restructuring. And you would think that something as basic and as, I don't know, as ordinary as cognitive restructuring, learning to change the way we're thinking according to evidence would not be very controversial. But boy, is it controversial. There's all sorts of debates around the usefulness of cognitive restructuring, and if so, when to do it. And this applies to many problems, but in particular to social anxiety, I want to discuss it. So first of all, there's the old behavioral debate as to whether there's any value in doing cognitive restructuring. It's all about exposure and habituation. But again, the research shows that for social anxiety, this isn't necessarily true of other anxiety disorders by any means, but it is definitely true of social anxiety that CBT is more effective than BT, than purely behavioral therapy, and that the cognitive change process in some form, not necessarily using a worksheet, but in some form doing cognitive change, cognitive restructuring, is an essential element to increasing the effectiveness of the therapy. But even within the CBT-related models, there is debate First of all, between the mindfulness-based models that say the best way to deal with our thoughts are to learn how to defuse from them, to be mindfully focused on something in the present moment and not pay attention to the thoughts at all and not do any cognitive restructuring because cognitive restructuring involves paying attention to the thoughts and the goal should be just to change our relationship with our thoughts, to distance from the thoughts thoughts, to see them just as passing ideas and not anything deserving our attention, versus the more traditional CBT models that say, well, that may be true for OCD and certain other problems, but for most anxiety and depression, for that matter, it's useful to sometimes pay attention to the thoughts and to challenge them against real-world evidence. In other words, do cognitive restructuring. My view is pragmatic. I see them both as useful. And frankly, most of my clients, and I always give out feedback forms and ask them what techniques and strategies they found helpful, most of my clients agree that they were both helpful. Some find cognitive restructuring more helpful, others find mindfulness and thought diffusion to be more helpful. I find that most of my clients find both of them to be helpful, not necessarily equally so, but both of them to be helpful. Typically, Clients are using cognitive restructuring before and after an exposure, after, before and after an experiment. Before an experiment to reduce their fear, at least moderately, so that they're willing to do the experiment in the first place. It's easy enough for a therapist to tell a client, learn how to change your relationship with your thought. In other words, do thought diffusion and mindfulness. But if the client fully believes that this thought is severe and dangerous, as it shows in the anxiety formula, then the client is not going to be able to diffuse from it, nor should they. As I gave an example last month, if a client believes that there's a bear present there, it doesn't help you to say, well, put that out of your mind and focus on the conversation if they think there's some sort of imminent danger, a bear, in, the, in their presence. Well, socially anxious people essentially think there is a bear there, not literally, but that there's some imminent danger that will cause catastrophic, horribly embarrassing, humiliating, and lasting harm to them. And if we don't help them learn how to challenge those thoughts, they're going to have much less success at putting those thoughts behind them using mindfulness and thought diffusion. But then there's more debate finally as to, okay, do you do cognitive restructuring before an experiment, which is the Heinberg model, which is what I originally learned, or do you do it afterwards as a result of learning from the experiment, which is the David Clark in, in Great Britain model, um, which is what I'm sort of gradually moving toward, and now I'm in sort of a mixed state. The people that say do it before an experiment are primarily stressing that it will reduce how difficult the experiment or exposure feels to the client. They're going to be more likely to follow through on it. The people that stress doing it after an experiment using the evidence that was gathered during the experiment stress that learning happens better when our thoughts and beliefs are being activated 
In other words, when they're feeling socially anxious, that learning will happen better then through the experiment itself than it does beforehand through a worksheet. I don't think it's quite black and white though because for many socially anxious clients, although not all, that simply doing the worksheet beforehand is an anxiety trigger because they have anticipatory anxiety about the experiment and they're facing that anxiety by doing the worksheet. So their anxiety, hot thoughts, and core beliefs are being activated at the time they're doing the worksheet, but obviously it's being activated more typically by doing the experiment. Basically, I usually teach people to do cognitive restructuring before an experiment early on and then gradually move them to doing it afterwards. And I just want to briefly show you the worksheets in which I do that. Uh, here it is. So, um, where is this? So this is an example of a cognitive restructuring worksheet I use, which is similar to what's often called a thought record. But the main difference that I want to stress is there's a big emphasis on identifying the safety-seeking behaviors. And at the bottom, after you write down the rational response, which I prefer to call a constructive attitude, there's also an emphasis on identifying action steps, behavioral goals, which are the alternative to the safety-seeking behaviors. And here's an example of a worksheet filled out. But for that's when doing cognitive restructuring before an experiment. It also could be used when feeling upset by something, such as during depression or maybe after an experiment that they feel embarrassed by or something. But here's another model of doing cognitive restructuring after an experiment. So this is called an experiment worksheet, where the first three columns are filled out before the experiment where you identify the hot thoughts as predictions of what you think will happen during the experiment. You identify what you want to do during the experiment. And, what, um, and then afterwards, you then analyze the outcome, you know, what actually occurred, which is the evidence that came from the experiment and what you can learn from it. So this is a single worksheet, which is much easier to use where the first part of it is done before the experiment and the second part is done after the experiment. But for those that are doing cognitive restructuring worksheet before an experiment, I also have a post-experiment worksheet to complete afterwards, which is similar but a little bit lengthier, where they identify ways that they help themselves or hurt themselves, hurt themselves usually through use of safety-seeking behaviors, help themselves through use of alternative constructive behaviors, as well as the positive and negative evidence that they gathered from the experiment. So either way, whether you do cognitive restructuring before or after an experiment or a combination of both, it's important to do it in some way because the experiments are huge learning experiences. And I tell clients that although I cannot guarantee that an experiment will go the way you want it to, that sometimes there are disappointing, uncomfortable, even embarrassing things that might happen, I tell them two things. One, usually they go better than you expect, usually. And two is, no matter how difficult the experiment goes, even when embarrassing or rejecting things happen, will always be a constructive learning experience if we use these tools. And I do believe that, and I do help clients learn something constructive from it. A couple other things I want to mention briefly before turning it in over for questions that you may have is another element that is useful for learning, um, in particular learning that they can cope better with um, the threats that may happen. I'm looking for this again. Is, well, let me just turn it. Hold on is to do some assertiveness training. And I talked about that more in depth at the last webinar, but I just want to point out two worksheets. I call it Head Health High Assertion Worksheet. Um, here's a blank one and here's a sample one filled out where you are helping clients identify the fears that they imagine could come true 
It might be that their anxiety shows. It might be they say something stupid. It might be that someone criticizes them as uninteresting or unattractive or that they forget what to say at a meeting or whatever. And it helps client come up with a constructive, non-defensive, non-aggressive assertion that they feel good about using. And then we do various types of role plays in session, as well as imaginal exposure, where they are practicing asserting themselves if their fear comes true. And we also set up experiments where they attempt to use their assertion. Now this is challenging because typically, at least with adults, most people keep their negative thoughts to themselves, certainly not always, but typically most of the time. And so usually a client's fear does not come true overtly, although sometimes it does. Sometimes even adults point out, gee, you're kind of red, what's the matter? I mean, I'm surprised at how often that happens with me. I'm an easy blusher myself. But more commonly, we just are afraid that our fear is coming true and we don't know if they are. So part of what I help clients learn is how to practice using assertions proactively. In other words, not waiting for their fear to come, to come true. So for example, they may paradoxically highlight their anxiety and say, oh, I hope you don't mind me. I blush easily. It's just part of my ethnic heritage. Or they might say, oh, sometimes I say stupid things. I hope you don't mind, but I guess we all do. Uh, so there's, there's examples of ways that a client can proactively assert themselves in an experiment without waiting for a fear to come true that chances are they'll never witness anyway. But again, it can be practiced in session, in role playing, where the therapist is portraying a critical stranger, or if you have a group where other clients are doing that. Those role plays are actually quite fun. And although it's anxiety provoking for the client at first, they usually start enjoying it. And they can also practice it using imaginal exposure. The last thing I want to mention again is imaginal exposure could be used not only for practicing using assertion when a fear comes true, but we can practice imaginal exposure ideally before doing an experiment in real life as a way to help a client feel more prepared more ready, less anxious about doing the experiment in the first place. David Clark would say, and I don't disagree, that again, doing cognitive restructuring, whether using a worksheet or imaginal exposure, because imaginal exposure is a kind of cognitive restructuring that happens through imagery, he would say that doing those before an experiment will lessen the learning during an experiment. I don't disagree with that. But I would say, but yeah, but that's made up for by the fact that there's learning that happens doing imaginal exposure or doing cognitive restructuring. And besides, if it gets the client to do the experiment, so much the better. But I certainly agree with Clark that if a client is willing to go out and do the experiment on their own without doing cognitive restructuring before or imaginal exposure before, they might learn more through the experiment itself. One last item is whenever possible, and of course this is true in CBT in general, but it includes CBT for social anxiety, start doing experiments with the client in session itself. So there may be field trips you can take with your client where you go out into settings together and you do experiments with strangers. You can do experiments as role plays in which you, or if you have a receptionist, um, have a conversation with a client and they're practicing focusing mindfully on the interaction rather than scripting. In fact, you might have them to do two different versions. One version where they're scripting everything to say and being super careful about everything to say. In other words, you're prescribing the safety seeking behavior. And then another version where they let go of that and just focus mindfully on the conversation itself and say whatever comes to mind naturally. So we can do experiments in session either as role plays or by going out together. And of course in group, one of the fun things is you can do field trips for the whole group where clients divide up into pairs and go out and do experiments together as well. So that's what I wanted to present and I wanted to open up for Mary to facilitate uh, questions. Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
One uh, attendee says, my clients would have a hard time seeing the value in the goal and experiment. They recognize the anxiety, but they don't see any alternatives. Do you have ideas for getting them to articulate the goal? Like even a checklist to start with so it is their idea and not mine. Sure. The basic, so I think of goals at different levels. I suppose they should be called goals and objectives, but I just call them all goals. The main thing is that I stress that a client keep the focus on their principal goals for being in therapy in the first place, such as making friends or advancing their careers or being able to use whatever bathrooms they want without the hassle of taking so-called safe bathrooms. So I focus on the end goal that the client is working towards, saying that the experiments are aimed at helping you get closer to that which is basically a motivational interview technique. But also, in doing cognitive restructuring, one of the rows in the worksheet there, but also in the David Clark model worksheet, which I presented as well, is identifying specific objectives, behavioral goals for the experiment itself. And mainly, those are turning safety-seeking behaviors around. So, if their safety-seeking behavior is avoiding eye contact, one of their goals would be to increase eye contact. If their safety behavior is to avoid talking about themselves, one of the goals is to talk about themselves more. Uh, if their safety-seeking behavior is scripting, one of the goals is to focus mindfully and say whatever comes to mind naturally without formulating it. In terms of helping the client see the value of working on those goals, we can practice that in session where they're likely to feel moderate anxiety doing that but less than they would in life outside of session and they could see how it tends to go better when you work on those goals rather than use the safety behaviors. The other thing in the worksheet, in the cognitive restructuring worksheet, is there is a row for what I call positive motivators, helping the client identify how you expect to benefit by doing this experiment. It will be good practice. I will grow in confidence. I will make a friend. Uh, I will find that I have a sense of belonging. Those are examples of positive motivators that we can help a client identify. Thank you. The next question is, how do you balance the pre-experiment assertiveness work with not over-scripting? That's a tremendous question because I mainly am telling clients, and it's an interesting thing that makes me smile, because mainly I'm, I spend a lot of time telling clients scripting is a safety-seeking behavior. It's the one that they're least likely to be aware of, uh, and that helping them see how it actually hurts more than it helps. And then we do assertion work, which is initially scripted. You know, this whole worksheet here is scripting assertions. So I start out by saying, look, there are two exceptions for scripting in my view. One is assertiveness, and sometimes it's really useful to think through ahead of time what we want to say in a sensitive situation in which there is risk for damaging the relationship or having a negative outcome of some sort. And of course the other example is giving a formal presentation where a certain amount of scripting is useful, although too much of it tends to backfire as well. But then in the course of role-playing, in the initial role-plays when we're practicing head held high assertions, it's quite scripted. But once I get comfortable with the scripted versions, and I explain to clients that we're going to do this, I don't just spring it on them, we do role-plays in which the client needs to think on their feet, so to speak, where I change the circumstance without telling them exactly, but still based on what I know of the client's fears. And their goal is to come up with assertions that they feel good about on their own, in the context of the role play itself. So in other words, it starts out scripted, which is a safety behavior, and gradually becomes less scripted and, and ultimately not scripted at all. Great, thank you. Well, I hate to cut things off, but we are reaching the top of the hour. So I do want to thank you, Larry, so much for taking the time out to give these two presentations. They were extremely popular and well-received, and we thank you for your time. And I want to thank our participants for being with us today. And once you leave the webinar, you will receive an evaluation of today's presentation. And even if you aren't seeking CE, we would very much appreciate if you would go ahead and complete that, because we're always looking to you know, make improvements and strengthen what we offer, uh, what we offer everybody.
And also within the hour, you will be receiving um, a follow-up email with a link to the recording of the webinar so you can watch it again to make sure you, um, you didn't miss any of the important information. So we hope that you will join us at the Anxiety and Depression Conference 2017, April 6th through 9th, to learn more about social anxiety and many other topics. And on behalf of ADAA and our presenter, thank you again for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great weekend.